Right, so first draft, final draft, um, and how do we identify what is good in a first draft? Because it's not gonna be what looks good in a final draft. I think most of the places where people look at a first draft and they think, ooh, that's so ugly, oh, that doesn't make sense, that's so complicated, and they throw that out the window, and that's actually usually the place where you're gonna find your story and your structure and your themes. So I'd like to open up, um, does anyone here feel like they have had that experience of a first draft to final draft where you're like, this final draft looks nothing like this first draft. <laughs> All right, let's, like, we got some, com yes, and in the audience, there we go. So would you guys like to start, what script was it for you guys that felt like had the most amount of transformation? I'm working on it right now. We're working right. on it. Um, I can't really say what it is because it's not, but it's, you know, but um, yeah, the first one, was based off the pitch. Mm -hmm. And then it got in, it was like, it's not really what, it just, you know, we did exactly what it was, but then it was like, it's not really what they want, you know, you, if you guys get someone who is unsure of exactly what they want and you give them something, a lot of times they'll be like, that's not what we want. So now we know what we don't want. Now we're going back and starting over. So that's kind of what we're doing right now. Yeah, it's also a good example that if you do, I think when you sell something off a pitch, um, you know, a pitch is not the script. No. And so just knowing the same way that like an idea you, if you're like, oh, I have the idea in my head, I see the whole thing in my head. No, you don't. Because um, <laughs> what works on the page never works in your head and what works as a verbal pitch is not going to work on the page. So uh, how did you then go about figuring out what like the anchor of the piece was? Like, what was the North Star that you're like, okay, this needs to stay the same and everything else around it's gonna have to change? The love story, always. Aww. Always, no matter what movie we're writing, we will always say, if you can find the anchor of the love story, then you can build anything around it. But whether it's a brother-sister love story yeah. or a mother-son love story or a romantic love story, like start there. <laughs> so we've had to just pair all the way back down to what is the love story and now how do we build around it. Great. And so since you guys do do a lot of different genres, it's just is that like the just in every single every thing? Every single one. I think it's really good to people, I mean, if you're an emerging writer, you probably, you may not have written enough to really understand what that anchor is, because I don't think it's something that you necessarily choose. I think it's something that chooses you, that you're like, oh wow, I just happen to be obsessed unconsciously. I know for me it's um, the search for family, fractured identity, and dangerous environments, even when I wrote a TV commercial. I still managed to get all of that trauma from my childhood in there. Um, I did not last very long in advertising. <laughs> they were like, go be creative somewhere else. Uh, there's also another hand. You guys had a, a story. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, in writer's rooms for television shows, inevitably, the thing you start with is not what you end with. Um, proof and that, of non-concept. Proof of non-concept, yes. Does not make a lot of sense as a term, but it works for us because it makes sense in our heads. Um, it's the idea that you put the thing on the board even though you know it does not work, and then finally someone else goes, that doesn't work, and you go, yes, that's right. <laughs> it does not work. Um, no, so uh, very often what happens is we've broken an episode and things continue down the line and something comes out in the next episode or two episodes down that radically changes something that you are working on in your episode. And while there are probably some anchor points, like plot anchor points of, of things that must be you know, uh, revealed or talked about in the episode, a story that needs to play out, there's a lot of stuff on the periphery that can very radically change. So that's definitely been our experience. And we, uh, you know, the, the example I will highlight is actually a, a spec that we wrote. Uh, yeah, let's get into that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, seriously, and, and we realize why the first draft is wrong is we didn't break it well enough to begin with, right? That's usually, you, you should be kicking those tires before you're getting to draft. And unfortunately, as we had our cards laid out on our living room floor. Because we have no room on our wall. We live together. And, uh, and we saw how the structure was working and the plot, it was like, yeah, this all works. And then you get down and you're like, I don't need this scene. Like you get very judicious when you're a TV writer, especially you're like, you're thinking down the line, like, okay, am I gonna amortize this set? Like, is that something I'm really gonna use? Okay, you're not thinking about that during first draft. Though. Well, I am, but, uh, and, and, so, and so then we, we rebroke our most recent spec 
six times? Six times. And wrote a draft each time within the course of two months. Page one rewrites. Yeah. We only had two scenes that stayed from the very first time to the last time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's normal. I mean, yeah. whether it's TV or if, if it is, you know, feature, then especially when you're writing a feature, I find that, you know, sometimes writers, they'll be like, oh, they'll, they'll go back and rewrite before they get to the end of their first draft, which I think is a very damaging, ter terrible thing to do. Because it's like every 10 pages, you're going to discover something new about the story that makes it great, that will require rewrites to be done. But if you just keep going back and rewriting the beginning over and over again, it's just such a waste of time. And just being like, just plow through that draft, make a list of all of those things that you're like, oh, yeah, go back and change the mother to a father. Oh, yeah, get rid of this character. And it's a much more efficient way. And, and doing page one rewrites, I'm a huge fan of the page one rewrite on every single draft. Because I think every time you're writing, you're becoming a better writer. And why would you want to use old tools? It's kind of like trying to rearrange your closet without taking anything out of the closet. Um, I don't know. Are anyone else here a fan of I, the page one rewrite? I, I'm a huge fan of the page one rewrite. And I was going to say something about what both of these guys said. Number one is that you said which draft or what script looks mm -hmm. very different from. Yeah. And for me, I'd say every single one. <laughs> and that kind of the point of a first draft is to just get the first draft done and to not expect. I, I was saying this to someone yesterday. You both have to feel like it's Oscar winning and garbage at the same time. If you can keep both thoughts in your head, because the thing that drives you to write it is going, this is so brilliant, I don't know how the world has lived without this for so long. <laughs> You're welcome. But at the same time, to finish it, lose a little bit of that, and go, okay, the whole point of that was to get it done so I can really now start writing, which is incredibly hard. Yeah. It's probably the hardest thing there is to do. Do you guys call it a vomit draft? Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 of course. And which is why the, the freedom of that, because every draft has its own pros and cons, the freedom of a first draft is you get to just try everything, do everything, and not be precious, which is why I agree with a first draft. It's not always the... I don't think I'd say quite as, like... I think you said like horrendous, terrible, awful to go back and rewrite a yeah. little. I don't know if I'd go that far. I think sometimes it, you can exercise certain muscles doing that, but I do think the, the agreement you have with yourself to not be precious about your first draft is yeah. the greatest gift you can give yourself. And then the second thing I was gonna say, because I think it's so smart about the love story, I always call it the central relationship, um, which is, I like love story better actually, but it's that, it's that, you know, if you feel like your script is not emotional, especially after a first draft, and, you're, and I'm, it's something I'm working on now, it was the key, it was the thing that was broken, and it's an incredibly hard story that I'm telling right now, it's a true story, and it's because I realized there was no really dynamic, fascinating central relationship, that I had characters who cared about each other, but they weren't invested in the way that you'd be invested in a family member or a, lo you know, a, yeah. a romantic partner. And so I just wanted to echo that and yeah. say how important I think I, that is. I think a lot of times when people think about structure, they get this very externalized form of like page this, this happens, and then page this, this happens. And it's not a very, that actually psychologically doesn't help most writers write. You know, like we understand structure in our lives through the change and shifts beginning and ends of our relationships. Our relationship to our job, our relationship to our friend, our relationship to our lover, our relationship to ourselves. And so I've always found like when it comes to structure, like, I mean, it's always going to be built around a twist or a change or an end or beginning of a relationship. And I find that that helps writers to write more emotionally in the early draft. Because if you don't have that emotional connection in the first draft, it's going to be very hard to inject it into a formed script in a later draft. So like, I always think of, if I read a draft, and even if it's not even formatted correctly, even if there's pictures drawn in it, but I go on an emotional journey, I'm like, that's pictures. a good first draft. People draw pictures and scripts. Well, I work with, I work with a lot with of writers people? who have very brain, have a lot of brain differences. So I have this one writer who, she got kicked out of three film schools because when she tries to communicate her script, she's like, it's like yellow coming out of the tube of thought. And people are like, I don't know what you want me to shoot. And so, but she's, I'm picturing the grip like, yeah, lady. <laughs> what the hell's yellow yeah. tube? So like, what's um, going on here? But, but, but she like, you know, okay. we, we have similar brains. You know, I'm dyslexic, I have ADD, I'm bipolar, um, schizotypia runs in my family. And so I, I, I was like, bring it on. And in, in three sessions, I was just like, okay, you're kinesthetic, you feel it first. And so I was like, just put it on the page what you feel. And part of that was her drawing pictures and part of it was her writing poetry. And then I'm like, okay, let's translate this picture like into the proper image. Let's translate this poem into the dialogue of the character and just 
taking the time to be like, everyone's brain is different and the way you are as a writer, the uniqueness of that is what will help you stand out in the industry. And I just hate how institutions try to take writers and say, you have to do it this way because all of you guys are so different and you right. want to honor the uniqueness of how each artist creates. Right, there's a different way to get that script, but the yeah. in script has to be producible, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. You gotta get it, you gotta get the craft in there That's by the I'm end. <laughs> but I'm saying, I don't care how messy someone's first draft is, I don't care what shape it takes, as if there is emotional truth in it, I can help them get it to look like a professional script. But when people bring me scripts that look like professional scripts, but there's no emotional truth in it, and there's nothing unique about that voice, I'm just like, that's much, much harder to pull off. Yeah, and we find that sometimes, like when we rebroke our uh, spec six times, it was because we were trying to, sometimes you combine characters, you realize, oh, I, I have two characters fighting for the same spotlight, so I'll just make it one, or you take them through what we call journey choice consequence. Um, so if you can track each character and ask what is their journey, what choice do they make in the script, and what's the consequence, good or bad, you're doing it right. And sometimes that might be their consequence will be in the next episode, but try to make it in that one, whatever it can be. And that's when we realize, oh, we have to keep rewriting this because somebody's not having a choice point, or, and, and sometimes that is about that key relationship. Well, it should be. We it should be emotional. Yeah, the character we thought was the protagonist wasn't the protagonist. <laughs> yeah. That happened on two drafts where we were writing the wrong person. That happens I a mean, lot. That happens ridiculous. a lot. Then usually the protagonist needs to be one that's the most active and goes on the largest journey. And so, you know, like if you look at something like Little Miss Sunshine, like that child, the girl is the main character, but the protagonist, the one driving that story is the father because he's the one that changes the most, goes on the biggest journey and is mo most active about getting what he wants. And so, you know, just, just sometimes not knowing which character to structure the drafts off of is part of the journey with it. Um, I'm interested for everyone, because uh, I think this is fun, um, what's the craziest note or most annoying note that you've like disagreed that you've had to incorporate and how did you do that if you did that successfully? <laughs> I say always do it if you're getting paid to do it. Yep. Take the note. Um, I'm trying to think, because there's been a couple. <laughs> what's the craziest? You guys go first. <laughs> Well, I'm working on something right now that is based on an older movie and its existing IP, obviously, in it. And so there's a great struggle between how much to preserve the original and how much to change it. So <laughs> I can't really give specifics because I, I can't really talk about it, but there's some crazy, crazy stuff going on where this is a character who is a little bit dated and a woman <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> There's a lot of guys in the room, and you know, there's the oh, how to say it delicately. Let's let's let Don't someone else do it. Do it. <laughs> delicately. Just yeah. say it. Yeah. There there is there's ideas about preserving who this person is, and um, that aren't necess don't necessarily conform with who she might be today. But again, it's a it's a it's a big movie, and there's a lot of cooks, and so I've gotten some pretty terrible notes. But um, <laughs> but I agree. See, when you're on a team that way, and you're at, you can only really have one leader. When you're writing something original, it's totally different getting notes. Yeah. But when you're being paid to write something, and you're not the boss, I mean, you're the boss of doing the best job you can. Um, it's not just that you have to grin and bear it. You actually have to really get behind it and do it and believe in it because you're part of a team. So I agree. that's a little bit, yeah. Do it if you're getting paid. Yeah. And sometimes we find a lot of times, I, listen, I'm the worst. I mean, y'all are not hearing this, but I'm shitty about taking notes. I get in there and they're giving me notes. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then... And then we come out, and Tobias is like, listen, every time, this is my writing partner, every time that um, we do this, and you're like, I, this is the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my goddamn life. I'm sorry. We talked about language, right? Trigger warning, we have Trigger foul mouth. Trigger warning, we have trash mouth. So... Oh no, are you vaporing right now? <laughs> so, um, and yeah, but every single time, even when it's a really, when we think this is the dumbest note I have ever heard in my life, I'm not, do, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And then it's like, okay, well, let me see. All right, well, okay, well, let me, okay. And then it always somehow makes it better. I, mean, I could I, not agree more. It's I have weird. To say, it's yeah. weird, right? I and have. Like, I'd rather eat shit than do this. And then you're like, oh fuck, it's better. I, I have, 
I, I have to say, and this is sort of the like uglier answer because yeah. it's a little, I think, more fun to be like, notes suck. Yeah. But I actually think notes are your best friend, and I say this all the time. Even bad notes, mm -hmm. I think, are helpful. And I think writers could do themselves huge favors by listening more. I think actually writers tend to go like, you just don't get it, it's right. in there and you're not seeing it. And what I always say is, so you're gonna go to every theater across the world and pause <laughs> and explain to the audience member, it's in there, you just didn't get it. It's yeah. super funny, you're just, you're not understanding it was on page four. Mm -hmm. I mean, when someone's giving you notes, they're telling you what you're trying to say isn't landing. Okay. And so I try to reverse it and go, this is great, this is help. Mm -hmm. So wait, I wanna sound really cool and funny and smart. It's not, tell me how to do it better. Like tell me, so it's not, and I gave this example yesterday to um, people I was talking to, but I think it's really helpful. It's, I think of it as like going to a doctor, and if you're the doctor as the writer, when a patient comes in and says, my knee hurts, you have to believe them, their knee hurts. Now it's your job to figure out what to do. Now if they come in and say, my knee hurts, and I've been on WebMD, and here's everything <laughs> you need to do to fix my knee, that's when you can say, you know what? Let's just stick with your knee hurts. Let me figure out how to fix your knee, you don't need to give me all the answers because I think that's where notes get terrible sometimes when somebody sees a problem and their instinct is to give you a whole fix and that's when you tend to go, that's not my script, I'm not doing that. But what's underneath it is very often really worthy. They're just not understanding what you're saying and if you can get past your rage <laughs> at somebody suggesting something so terrible, yeah. what you can get into is, so what are you not understanding? Here's what I was trying to say, it's not coming across, so help me say it. Then they're enlisted and they feel great too and now you're collaborating, you've got their help, they've got your ear. And I will tell you, nine times out of 10, it makes it better. So yeah. that's my feeling, uh, even with terrible notes. Yeah, no, no, no. It, you, I, the benefit of the note stems more from the creativity and work ethic of the writer using that note. Because every a note is just an opportunity for more effective storytelling. And if you do get a note, like, and f yeah, fixes aren't helpful, but most people can tell when something's not working in a script. Most people don't understand what's not working, where it's coming from, and how to fix it. But a really good languaging that you can, you can use if anyone does give you a note that you bump on and don't, are just like, ugh, that sounds terrible, is if they're like, well, maybe you should make her a clown. And, and then that's when I would say, Cool, interesting. Um, if I made her a clown, what would that give you? And they're like, oh, well, then it would be funnier. And I'm like, oh, so the real note is it's not funny enough for them. And then I can find a way with my voice and my humor to make it funnier. But it's just a really lovely way of getting underneath what the note is really about. Because like, yeah, you may have pain in your knee, but it's actually stemming from the backpack that you're wearing. It doesn't need to be treated on the surface. Yeah. I, will, I will tell you the note that I find incredibly not helpful, and that is make better. <laughs> and it make happens it, uh, a lot. Make it 30% um, funnier. <laughs> uh, MB is like the bane of my existence. Anyone who just, like your line of dialogue and it just says make better. <laughs> and you're like, w w okay, so I'm magically supposed to become a better writer than you, or, you perceive me to what be. What does better mean? Like when you're working yeah. in an art form, and this is why if your goal ever is to make your script better, you're going to be disappointed. The language that you use triggers different operations in your mind. And if you, so if you say, oh, I wanna make this scene better, like the little man in your head is like, what, what does better mean? Like. So you have to be really clear with the languaging you use for yourself or if you're giving notes to someone else and say like, oh, we need this to go quicker or we need this to be more visual and really clarify things that you can tell objectively if it is moving forward or not, but good, better, those things, that's like looking at your Excel document and being like, organize awesomely. <laughs> And Excel's gonna be like, could you tell me which column? Like, could you tell me like numbers? Like, you have to be really clear with that languaging. So make better is the m least effective note you can give anyone. And it happens, unfortunately, quite a bit, especially in television. And I mean, the implication of make better is this sucks. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, great, it sucks. But how, in what way does it suck? Like, is We've it never gotten that note. <laughs> uh, no, the, uh, it is 99% it the note behind the note. It, it, I feel Feel like any time I'm reading the notes, I'm I'm not looking at what they're at, I'm not looking at their solutions. I'm not looking at their, you know, Jane should be running on page four. 
Um, and I say, well, Jane is in a wheelchair. I'm not sure she can run. And they would say, they would say, oh, okay. So the note behind the note is you want more action. Yeah. You're you're looking for her to be more um, action motivated. So the, it's always understanding that's where it's coming from, yeah. and that takes the onus off of you of taking it personally because they're gonna come at it like this is your baby and they're attacking it and you're gonna be like, ah, and then you have those reactions of like, stop attacking my baby. And then, um, but if you can just think of it as like, all right, I'm bringing this car in for service. Can we all just sort of kick the tires and let's find out collaboratively like how we make it better. It just changes your mindset yeah. when you go well, into those notes. Well, all suffering comes from expectations. And so I feel like just never like a script I want is, that on a t-shirt. It's I, basic Buddhist principles, you know, um, but all suffering comes from expectations. So if you go into a room, if you submit your script to someone and your unconscious expectations expectations are that they're gonna be like oh my god you are the next Charlie Kaufman this was so brilliant I'm just gonna give up writing because you're so no that is never gonna happen like I read for a lot of festivals I've never given a 10 out of 10 to a single script I've ever read because it's a meant to be like there is no best there is no this piece is done scripts are abandoned they're like children they just get to a point where you're like get out of the house <laughs> You can come home for Christmas, but you need to move out and you're not done being a parent. You know, like the script is never done. It's never going to be perfect. Like you just have to get it to the place where it works. Um, and it's a great example of what you're capable of doing at that moment artistically and craft wise. Yes. Do you uh, ever get that note of, um, there's a lot of good stuff in here. <laughs> that's, you're in trouble. Like uh, that, that's, oh. <laughs> All expectation leads to, um, all suffering comes from expectations, right? So if you go in expecting the person to just give you 800 annoying notes and they only give you 400, you're gonna be like, yeah. You know, they, uh, they did great studies about um, Olympians and they noticed that silver medalists are very unhappy. Gold medalists are rock, like they love it, they're super happy. Bronze medalists are like, yeah, woo, made it on the podium. But the silver medalists are just like, because they're just like, I could have had gold. And so it's that expectation, like the way you feel about your work has more to do with what you're expecting and what you feel like you might have just lost than it has to actually do with the quality of the work or the money that you got for it or the credits that you got for it. And just so having that mindfulness of you don't have to suffer as much, a lot of writers just unnecessarily suffer. Yes, the process is gonna be painful, but the way that you choose to look at it, the mind frame that you have about your work and what you're doing is what's actually causing most of your suffering. Um, if that makes any sense to, to Where everyone. were you like 10 years ago? Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I was doing my, th I was a little baby researcher back then uh, doing it, but um, I'm here now. Uh, a lot of my writers are, are TV or in the writer's room, the professional writers, some of them trying to move either up to showrunner or over into films. And I was, you know, we were talking about this festival. I was like, God, there's so many great panels, like, for emerging writers. There's so many amazing people to share their stories. But, you know, I've got a couple of writers here. And I'm like, you know, there's... It's like almost like we think that once you start getting paid to write, that you're suddenly going to be confident and the fraud police are never going to knock on your door and you're going to know how to write everything. And it's just not true. And there's just not a lot of stuff programming or, or, or people that are philosophically speaking about, okay, then when you get on this level, like how do you manage that? Because if you're not happy as an emerging writer, I promise you getting that job in the writer's room is not gonna make you happy. It's only going to make it harder because once you're on their level, you have more to lose. Yep. Like, you know, if, if you're an emerging writer and you write a shitty script, what happens? Austin says, no, thank you. Like, no one even has to know, right? But if you write a bomber script and you lose a very expensive deal and you lose that celebrity and some, you know, then it's like your entire ego and identity is on the line. And your rent. And your rent, you know? And so it's, it's just an important thing to remember, I think. And that might be a good question for you guys. Like, what is the practice that you wish that you would like really nail down before you started getting paid to write that would have helped you so much more now? Like a practice or a behavior or, yeah, yes. Getting Mickey as a writing partner. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Boom! Good collaborators. Yes, good, good, good collaborators, absolutely. 
I mean, especially anything with just regards like artistic, mental, and emotional health. I feel like it's something that's not talked a lot about in the industry that I wish was. Um, most of the TV writers I know like have panic attacks in their car after work on a daily basis. I think that's, I think that's a big part of it is the understanding that truly it happens to everyone. I mean, I don't know that humans can ever really absorb this idea because it, we're sort of built to look at people who are gorgeous or famous or wealthy and just be positive that they're okay. And it is such a hard concept to really feel and understand that they're not. It's really true. And um, there is something not comforting in that you're, you know, the schadenfreude of it all. You're not taking pleasure in their pain, but the idea that you're not alone is massive. That you can be the most successful filmmaker on the planet and have a bomb and you feel just as shameful and humiliated um, and guilty and awful as a first timer. And um, th I think that knowledge that everybody has that truly, truly is helpful. Everybody I mean, that, that feeling poops. that you're not alone. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Everybody poops. <laughs> there you go, well said, yeah. but exactly. It, that, but that's, that's why I think it's- I don't, I, I don't know why I even tried. But that's, that's why I think it's good to, like, to, to, to practices, that like there's these, you know, artistry we practice, bravery we practice, it's something, you don't just have it and then you're good. You don't just get confidence and then you're like, it's, it's like a muscle. If you stop exercising that muscle, it will lose its ability. And so this idea that self-compassion or, you know, valuing your work or, you know, managing your expectations, like that's something that you have to do on a daily basis, just like feeding yourself. And yet there's this belief, I think, of people where they're like, oh, you either have it or you don't. And if you have to ask for help, then you don't have it. And there's just a lot of pain I see in the writing community that is unnecessary. Well, the other thing I think to remember that, that I wish I'd known and I've learned, um, and again, you may just have to learn this viscerally, <clears throat> it's mostly failure. It's mostly down. I mean, I, I, I can't emphasize that enough, that it's so good to have confidence in yourself, and you have to if you're going to do it, but this understanding that it's, you take 10 swings, 10 chances, and you are so lucky if one and a half of them comes to fruition. I can't emphasize that enough. And for some reason with writing, people assume you can become a prof professional writer and do it part time, or you can have, and I was saying to someone yesterday a similar thing, which is I think when you're starting, you absolutely can do it part time. And when you get really successful, you can manage your schedule however you want. You can you know, take the jobs you want. But when you're really trying to do it and become professional and really get in there, it's, your life, and you have to be willing to understand that you're gonna write eight scripts and seven of them are gonna go nowhere. And, and truly, that is, that is the case. It's not, and it doesn't matter how successful you are. If you asked 10 successful people how many projects they have that have never seen the light of day, you'd be here for hours. They all do. And so I think the thing I'd wish I'd known, that again, you really have to learn because you take every failure as proof that you're not good enough. And every failure is just, oh yeah, that's like a Wednesday. That's just par for the course. That's what you're doing here. That's what it is. And then the other stuff is the exception. And if you're very fortunate and you're working really hard and you're doing it enough and you have a lot of product, hopefully your numbers go up, but it changes. I do wish I'd known that more. Yeah, I started as a, I was a playwright first and I would submit scripts to 320 places a year. And on average, I'd get eight. And I was doing better than most of my friends because I was just like, it's a numbers game. I'm like, this is just like asking people out. You ask 100, someone's going to say yes. <laughs> like, uh, but, but it's true. And, it's like, and, I, and I know it sounds a little bit negative, but like the thing about failures are, it's like, it's like when you're learning to ride a bike. Every time you fall over when you're learning to ride a bike, it isn't a failure. That is your body actively calibrating how to balance. It is necessary for the process, right? So I don't see those as failures. I'm just like, script one through five was me, you know, learning how to deal with my mother. And the next one is me figuring out action sequences. And, then, and, and all of those, what they do is they stack on top of each other, creating this ladder that then allows you the ability to get to that next space. Yeah, but it's rare that you can, you can look at that, you know, without 
just feeling devastated every time you have to start over. I mean, it's just like, oh my God, why can't I get this right? I mean, very often, you know, the, the thing about your final draft versus your first draft is it we were talking about this before, it seems so easy. Like, why didn't we have this the first time? Like, why were we, like, struggling so hard, and yet you had to? You couldn't have gotten to the final draft without the first and the second and the eighth yeah. and whatever, because that's just the process. And I think the, the challenge here is, I mean, I used to sit there, and I did it for about eight years. Um, and I heard all the things, but it's incredibly difficult to internalize those things until you're actually doing it. And so, you know, we can tell you that this is, you know, th these are the things we wish we knew and you'll write them down and that's awesome. Um, it is something you kind of have to just expect that one day you'll wake up and go, oh yeah, they did tell me that, didn't they? <laughs> Yeah, that is true. That is how it is. Yeah. I, th I, I think the one thing I wish I would have known, and this is from starting as a staff writer, um, they always tell you, like, there are rooms that say, uh, don't talk at all. And there are rooms that say, have one good idea a day and be quiet the rest of the time. Um, and then there are rooms that are like, no, you're a pitch machine. Your job here is to throw the spaghetti at the wall. And all those things come at you, and you're sort of trying to calibrate and figure out where you're places in that room. And I remember when I got my first script, I was really kind of freaking out. And Tom Speziali, who is a, I think, a producer or EP on Watchmen now, kind of just took me aside and he's like, Julie, go with the flow. Don't try to fight the flow. Don't try to stop the flow. Just go with the flow. And that sounds so easy, right? Like, that's a t-shirt. But at the time, I was like, yeah. Yeah, why am I, like, because I was trying to, why isn't the script working? And why isn't that actor doing, the, I was worrying about the stuff on the show that was not my job. That was not what I was there for. That's a showrunner's job. And so I was trying, as a control freak, trying to fix, put out all the fires I was seeing happen. And <laughs> instead of just enjoying the fact that I was in the room and my job was actually, not the easiest, but the least, um, the stakes weren't as high for me because all anyone expected me to do was sit there and just come up with some good ideas all day and write a really good script and not worry about the other stuff. So that would be my one piece of advice is there's going to be fires everywhere. Try to focus on the one thing that you're there for. That's, that's good. I was going to say... Uh the other thing too is that once you are actually doing this for a living, it is you are basically Lucy at the chocolate factory. <laughs> you are basically just trying to stay ahead of the next thing that's coming down the line. And the good news is much like the falling off the bike and getting back on the bike and falling off the bike and getting back on the bike, you're getting incrementally better. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it because you're doing a page one rewrite and I'm, you know, this is like the third one and it's like, here we go. No, but every time you're doing it, you are you are becoming better at it. You know, the, the process becomes slightly less painful just in the, the the aggregate as opposed to every single time you you pull up the screenwriting software and start with the blank page. You know, and so I think that because you get so heads down and are waiting for the chocolates and trying to catch them as quickly as you can, you lose sight of the fact that you are actually improving as a writer. It just doesn't feel like it in the moment. It's, it's harder to see when, when change is happening little at a time. It's hard for us to notice because we're adapting to it every single day. And so that's why I think it's always important to have someone outside of you that you trust that isn't looking at your stuff consistently, but is maybe like every six months checking in because they're going to be able to be like, oof, wow, like your dialogue is really enhancing. Or, oh, like your, your, your writing's more emotional in this place. You're getting, ooh, that subtext is, is really advanced. And, and it's just really, it's, so much more helpful to have someone outside of you, the work that you do that you trust that will be very honest with you because they can just see things that you won't be able to see. If you want to be a writer, you should probably enjoy writing. And some, <laughs> But sometimes people are like, oh, I have to do another draft. I'm like, but but isn't it fun to write? You know, and, and keeping that, most psychologists agree that one of the most effective things for creativity is that the motivation is internal. That if the only motivation you have to write a piece is external, that the creative 
networks in the brain are not going to activate. And so I just think it's also really important to, rem to always find the joy in the writing and, and bring yourself back to that like inner child. You know, because all of us probably wrote something somewhere between the ages of like four and 12, and someone was like, oh my God, you're so good. And then dopamine released in your brain, and then you became obsessed with getting that dopamine again, and, and that's why we're all writers, um, uh, is chemicals in the brain. Uh, but if, if, you, if you bring yourself back to that kid that wrote just because they wanted to write, that wasn't writing for money, I find that bringing yourself back to that age, I mean, like, let's have fun going in here and doing this again is much more helpful because you have to have that sense of play in order for the creativity to be there and yeah yeah I'll just say this really quickly um, so you can get to your next question uh, 15 year old me is like the happiest person on the planet right now because I get to write Star Trek and that was the that was the greatest thing in my life growing up so the first time we're writing our script and I get to talk uh, you know I get to write something about a character being on the bridge and you know giving the command to go into warp drive it was like you know a shivers down my spine I was like I'm doing this for real now like this is a thing and then I brought out all of her fanfic for that she wrote when she was 10 and embarrassed first of all unfortunately I'm too old for it to have been called fanfic because it wasn't called fanfic back then it was like you know whatever but it, it, <laughs> The point is that yes, 15 year old me was writing it and just dreaming about the thought that maybe someday I would get to do something like that. And of course up to now I've been writing on other things that are not Star Trek and it's awesome. But like there are very often, there have been days when we're like, we gotta go to work and 15 year old me is like screaming in the back of my head, hey, hey, you're writing Star Trek. Get in the car and get excited, man. God. What's wrong with you? And then I go, yes, yes, 15 year old me. Okay, I get it. We're going to write Star Trek today. So, yeah. like, no, childhood you will keep you in check. Like, and because they're also not corrupted, right? And they're not, so like, I, I'm a big fan of doing meditative work of like the inner child, the inner adult, the inner um, elder, always writing, building story from the inner child, editing from the inner adult, and then uh, uh, pitching from the, the inner elder, because she don't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> But that, that child inside of you is the most creative, you know, 98% of children um, test as creative geniuses, only 13% of adults do. And so there's something that gets beaten out of us through our education and through our jobs. And I just think it's an important part to like foster that and bring that back. And just having that meditative image of you at 15, you know, in that outfit with that shirt and that bag. I just... do have that photo, so I can actually <laughs> literally look at it. So that's yeah. good. Yeah, so, but everyone can do that. And it's like really, really lovely because then you're taking advice from yourself and you're probably gonna trust that more than a complete stranger. Uh, so the next question I have is about rewriting. So there's a lot of people who have different approaches to the, the way in which they approach the rewrite. And so I would be interested to hear from everyone, you know, just do you have a, a consistent approach to each draft that you follow or is it chaos? 100% chaos. Yeah, chaos. <laughs> it depends on what the notes are. Yeah. Yeah, are they shitty notes <laughs> that I have to go in and we're like, that's a shitty note. And then we have to find the note behind the note, and that's a little more chaotic. And then sometimes the, what we find our favorite notes are page 34, could you, just a little bit here, and da, da, da. And then it's like structure notes, right? So yeah. that's easy. So, yeah, otherwise. Do you, do, you, do you, like, have a list, or are you just, like, do you guys sit down? Because I think having a partner is, is probably a little bit different than, than doing it yourself where you've got – I feel like I have to be super organized with it, where I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna make a list of like the biggest he, things to the littlest things. He does things. that, I'm like <laughs> <laughs> So he's usually constantly like, like psychically think around me going, pat it down, patting it down, patting it down. Cause I'm like spinning out and he's like, it's okay, it's okay, like that. So you guys are like the Tesla I'm Edison the yellow, of... I'm the yellow coming out of the tube. <laughs> when you said that... Yellow coming out of the when, tube of thought. No, when you said that, he looked at me, he goes, you get that. And I said, I totally get that. I get the yellow coming out of the tube of thought. And he's going, those are really good words. You know, words come out, you know, so... Great, so, so I get Team her. chaos and padding. I dig that. It's cool because you guys are probably just like 
dif different sides of the same brain. I mean, exactly. I think we all have that chaos and then organization, mm -hmm. but we yes. have to have it on our own, which is why we're insane. <laughs> but um, no, I'm much more. I'm much more methodical. I tend to. Um, and I don't think there's a right way to do anything, but it calms me to be more, um, I sort of t cohere all the notes I've gotten from all the sources, and I do try to get notes from a few different people. And then I have my own notes. I find the most helpful thing in the world to do in rewriting, and I don't know how many people do this, but I have such a different experience when I print out a script and go through it than looking at it on a computer. So if you don't do that, I highly recommend it. It buys you a perspective you don't even know you're missing. So I never rewrite on just the yeah. screen. So I print it out, I go through it, I have my own notes, I'm my own harshest critic. Then I take all the notes everybody else gave me, and what I do is I literally put in the notes in the script in bold, and I just go through and go, okay, you know, make this, make her more invested in this scene. And then I just sort of keep going through and refining the notes and thinking about it, and I do probably 10 versions of just going through and thinking about the notes, adding more to the notes, you know, maybe taking a few away, going, oh, these two people were saying the same thing, until I have a document that has the script and, and clear notes that I want to do in bold. I think, to me, the hugest thing is taking time with notes so you really can absorb them. Sometimes there's an anxiety of, I got these notes, I want to put them in and fix it all right away, and I personally don't know how to do that because I have to sit with them and think about it. But I find that writing them down and going through them many, many times until they're sort of in a clear way, then I can kind of calmly sit down and execute and, you know, create more notes to be gotten. <laughs> Uh, being a team helps because we're able to, like we just got notes on a project yesterday when we were sitting in the bar and saying, okay, did you, what did you think of this note? What did you think of that note? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're immediately revising as we're talking it out because we're, we're on a writer's room, right? So I can say, all right, so if we lose that scene, we could put that beat here. And we're not writing any of this down. It's just a mental you're going through it, you're playing it out in your head, and then we sit with the script and say, okay, let's put all the notes in one, because sometimes you'll get like four different sets of notes, and you put them all in page order, and you'll see where they collab collaborate, and you go, okay, mark that one, because everybody's picking up on page eight, where you, know, you had Susie in a wheelchair, and, and you just like keep going through it, and then we will divide and conquer, because we are a team. And so it'll, it'll be, I'll take teaser through act three notes, and you do the end, and if there's things that we have to track over the course of the script, you know, we do that sort of merge together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, similar to what you were saying, I, I think if we've handwritten notes, like someone has verbally given us notes, we, did, we first have to go through, you know, the organize and sort mm -hmm. of those and make sure that we understand what are the, what's the low-hanging fruit, what are the easy, easy fixes, like, oh, we don't want this person in this scene, well, that's easy, I take them out. Um, this scene needs to be completely rewritten. That's a much bigger note. I gotta work on that. That's gonna take us some time to figure out what's the mechanics, especially if there's like a lot of movement or a lot of action. Well, now we gotta do choreography and now we gotta figure out where's the person at the top of the scene? Where are they ending up? And you know, so then you know, once you've sort of like gone down the hit list of, for us, I think the easy stuff, We've split that up and we've given, each of us has taken some easy stuff so we feel like we're making progress and no, another, neither one of us is bogged down. Then we take the tough stuff and we work through it. Like, so we, we had this conversation yesterday. When we get home from all of this, we will sit down again and we will come at the notes fresh once more. And, you know, having had a couple of days for, the, to, for them to just kind of live in our, in our brains, we can reread them and go, okay, What's changed? Have we, have we ruminated on this and ha have come to a decision of how we want to address this note for anything that we haven't figured out yet? And then we'll write up some, some brief bits of like, here's the, here's the shorthand of how we want to fix this, and then we'll take those, split them up, and do them. Awesome. I love that you brought up uh, a little bit of what, what you didn't call, but I would call it, there's a little bit of procrastination and that like how important a little bit of procrastination is to the creative process. So anyone here procrastinate? 
yay, um, it's not that you're bad, um, it's your creativity working. Because there's a certain things where it's like, your brain's like, yeah, we know how to do this. And there's other problems that need to be solved or story elements that, you know, you need to walk around the room and see it from a different perspective and start visualizing and, and really just daydreaming about it and letting it sort of daydream in the back until, you know, you figure out what it needs to be. And I, I, I don't like it when writers try, I mean, unless you're on deadline and you just got to get it out, but if you have the ability to, to just daydream about a more difficult note or concept and, and let it sort of float around in the back of your mind or go work on something else or do something creative and go for a walk, it's really, really effective. Um, if you just sit down and try to like force your way to think through it, because when you actually, there's a difference between thinking and daydreaming and thinking activates the analytical left side of the brain, which suppresses the right side of the brain, which is the only part of the brain that is capable of new and novel thinking, AKA creativity. Yeah. So it's a really good thing if you find yourself thinking too hard and you need to come up with something new, just be like, let me just daydream and like visualize and fantasize about this and then you'll be activating the part of your brain that actually can help you. Yeah, I call that background processing. <laughs> I worked in IT for 13 years and so, you know, a lot of my terminology is very nerdy and I relate it to my former career. And, and you know, background processing is when a computer is running a program and you can't see it, you don't know it, you know it's there and it's taken up some REM cycles, but you know, you are not actually actively mentally on the problem so sometimes we'll be looking at something I'm like I gotta background process this that means it's gonna it's gonna live in my brain I'm not really gonna think about it but it's gonna like prop up when I'm taking a shower or I'm driving to work or whatever it is and then one moment it'll be like it's just done bing and the answer comes up and I go great I know what it is now if we're finding that we're stuck on something in the room we do what you just said is we literally take a walk we're like we'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll just just walk around the building and on that walk we're talking out the problem and I am not exaggerating when I say 9.5 times out of 10 we come back with a solution it is yeah. insane how literally just getting up and moving out of that environment will change your perspective because then somehow your brain just sort of eliminates the chuffa and you can focus on it, it's, laser it's, focus. Um, for the, the good thing is to do an activity that doesn't require cognitive function can be just muscle memory so like I have a weighted hula hoop because I'm like, also, it's really hard to take yourself seriously when you're hula hooping with a rainbow hula hoop in your living room, just being like, all right, let's daydream about this problem. Because um, sometimes what happens is you get so serious with it, and you're like, oh, I have to figure this out. And then what it does is almost like the brain tightens up. And when you tie, all the great ideas are like underneath that. And so it tightens up. So you're like, you're trying to reach through when you can't get through. And so doing an activity that is but muscle memory, this is why such great activities come to you when you're in the shower. Cause you're just like, oh, I've been doing this. And, and that, then the brain loosens up and then suddenly you can reach down into the, like the unconscious and pull out those really awesome ideas. And so just, if you sit for longer than 10 minutes thinking about something, get up, start moving, <laughs> go do something, you know, go trip over a microphone cord. What is happening? I feel like I'm doing a really bad dance routine over here. Um, but it's a really, just knowing you don't have to sit there and feel frustrated. Like if you're feeling frustrated, change the activity. There's no reason to sit there and beat yourself up. I think it's fascinating. Like, I mean, you talk about mental processes and something that's sort of emerged in the last few years in some writers' rooms is that you'll see writers um, using coloring books. Right, and, and I mean, it seems like this very juvenile activity, but it really focuses the brain sometimes where someone's pitching something and you can be sitting there and coloring and you're just, I don't know what it is, but there's something about the peacefulness of coloring and the focus that I can hear the pitch and then I can sort of process it better. Well, what it, it's kind of like is it's like your conscious and your unconscious brain are like uh, the children and a babysitter, <laughs> right? And so it's like for creativity, you kind of just want something easy enough to distract that. You just want that boy from across the street to start talking to her on the porch so the kids can be like, let's burn the house down. Like, let's build something creative. Let's, let's get into the cabinets. You know, and that way, the most creative part of you can take action because if, if the, that conscious part isn't distracted enough, it's gonna be trying to maintain order and safety, which is not conducive for creative thought. Right, so it's just giving that little bit enough to distract you cognitively, not so much that you have to be fully focused on the activity, but you can do it sort of mindlessly so that all of the little like demons inside of your mind can sneak out and, and start you know, messing things up, which is, which is what you want for creativity. My kitchen is very clean when I'm thinking. <laughs> 
how well I'm doing on a draft is dr you can tell by looking at how, how clean my apartment dishes. is. Yes, because I'm like, I'm going to get this little dark. Or you're like, I'll go to the gym. Yeah, I've got to go uh, to the I never gym. say that. <laughs> you are the never, only person I know that does that. That is never ever. <laughs> ever. But if I were, co I was listening to you color, I, I would be like, I wouldn't hear, if I were coloring, I wouldn't hear I'm the anything. Same way. I'd be like, oh, look how pretty. Yeah, it works for thing. her. It does not yeah, work. Yeah, and I have to be doing something shitty yeah. like this. And, and that's an important thing to remember. Everyone's brain is different. Like, you know, I'm, I have ADD, which means like I'm more comfortable working on seven projects and I can manage seven projects at once. If you don't have ADD, also I work with writers up to seven a day. I'm used to doing switch, switch, switch world, switch world. If you're not used to doing that, if your brain's not structured that way, then don't do that type of processing you know and just getting to know the way that your brain works uniquely and what works for you and know that anyone who tries to tell you oh well you have to do it this way is either full of shit or lying or trying to sell you something honestly um, just be like how much is your program yeah. um, <laughs> uh, but for we talked a little bit about rewriting for final drafts um, how do you know when you're done are you ever done I don't believe so, no. but, but how do you know when to kick the baby out of the house? When someone else has it and you can't get it back. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like when it's done, they're filming it. And even then it's not done because you're, they're like, oh, let's, let's adjust these scenes really quickly. Or the actor's like, is there another way to say this? It's the same, but totally different. And you're like, sure. So um, when it's, when you can rent it. I think that's when you're done, when you can rent your movie. Or how, how about for emerging writers, like before you really sold stuff, like when you were in your first few pieces, when you were writing, like how did you know, all right, I'm gonna put this one down, I'm gonna send it out, and I'm gonna start the next piece? I, to me, there's something when you're able to defend every scene, and I don't mean being defensive, that's a totally different thing, but I mean you're really being honest with yourself and you understand the purpose for every word in the script. And the honesty is the hard part because, you know, again, you'll get a note, somebody saying, I don't quite understand this or I don't buy that they would do this, and your instinct is to explain it and say why. And the important thing before you're really, really done is to go, they're, maybe they're right, maybe, or, or at least they're right in their minds that, you know, they're not buying this person doing that. It doesn't even have to be that you're 100% right by the end, but I always know the difference when a friend of mine came up with this term, and I love it, I mean, it's a term, but for writing is vamping. I know when I'm vamping and I'm like, oh, I'm just filling in here because I, I can't defend it yet. So I am filling it in to with music that sounds like it's like a song and it sort of matches but I can't defend it really except to say it's great background when I can talk about the characters their relationships the action their journey so calmly and confidently and simply like it doesn't need a lot of explanation I can just say they're starting here they end up there this is the stuff that goes on in the middle that helps them get from here to there and I know why it's in there that generally feels to me, I, don't, I agree, I don't know that you're ever done, but that feels to me like I'm, I'm done. We have a, we have a writer's group. Um, we've had it for about six years, it's all women, and we found women that were in the same place as us, really not gonna give the mom notes, not pat us on the back, but give you the like, down and dirty notes because we want all of you know we wanted each other to succeed and so that's been a good barometer for us of figuring out when a script is done too because once everybody sort of collectively has stopped giving you um, big idea notes and it's more like what if she's wearing a red shirt in that scene you're like okay if if, th if that's what you're worrying about then your script is starting to be fine if there's no structural issues or character issues or I don't believe so and so would do that. Um, so that's been a good barometer for us is just having peer a peer group to know, okay, we've, we've kicked that can as far as we can. Let's put it on a back burner and let's start a new thing. And you may go back to it, but nine times out of 10 is pretty done at that point. Because I found as a writer, the first instinct is usually the correct one. Um, or I mean, a lot of times it is. And how do you fight against it? Great, yeah, so first instincts versus when people want you to shift or change something. Do you guys feel like your first instinct's always correct? I don't feel like my first instinct. So we may be different in that regard. I don't, you know, nothing is for everybody. That's for me. Um, I feel like what's usually correct is what's underlying, the reason I want to tell the story. That doesn't change. But for me, that's slightly different than instinct because how you tell the story 
um, may, may shift a lot. What I find with that is I, I tend to really listen to, first of all, a very smart person once said to me, consider the source, always. <laughs> Um, and I think that's why it's important. Having a peer group is huge. I've also had a writing group since film school. And yeah, it's, ma it's so unbelievably helpful. Um, you know who is smart and who has your best interest at hand, and you also know who's just giving you love notes and who is maybe got a different agenda. So to me, the answer to your question is I like to give things to at least four or five people. If four or five people are saying to me some version of, I don't get it, not I don't like it, or ooh, that's different, or it makes me uncomfortable, but really some version of, I'm not understanding it, or it's not grabbing me, I, I tend to listen. If it's something that it doesn't come from someone who can articulate why, or maybe it's just a character they've never seen before, or something groundbreaking, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. But I think there's truth a lot of times in, in numbers and in smart people. That's my... I think sometimes, too, other people can kind of see through the thing you can't. You know, so very oftentimes, you know, you think you know what your story is and you think you know what it's about and who's a, who it's about. And then you'll give it to somebody else and they say... I think the shape of your story is very different than what you think it is. And they'll be able to give you some insight based on their read that changes your perspective. Now you can agree with it or not, but you should definitely pay attention to those, those pieces of feedback because they're telling you something that you are not picking up yourself. Like you have subconsciously done something in your story that you are not conscious of and they've got it for you and you're like, what? That's enormous, that part, that piece, is that we think we're seeing it, and why aren't they seeing it, or why aren't you getting this? And to have that objectivity, to trust in it, if people are saying, and I said this before, I don't see it, I don't get it, you're trying to say something, it's not coming across, it's something very often to listen to. And I always ask the question, why now? That's usually when you're going in to pitch something. They want to know why do they need to do this project now? And so the thing that you were saying, like clinging to the, the there you are, the, clinging to the idea of, um, you know, but I really felt like my instinct was right. Hopefully the instinct is the why you want to tell the story and the why now of it. And that's the nucleus of what you need to hold on to for your story. Everything else can change, right? We've yeah. seen 15 different Marilyn Monroe movies. Everybody does it differently, but it's about Marilyn Monroe and blah, 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 right? So I, just the I, why now, I think I, ask yourself that. Well, I think also a thing to consider is there's a difference between like the art and the execution of it. Like, so sometimes what people are really saying is this isn't executed the way it needs to be, not that the actual instinct or impulse or artistry of it is off. And that also needs to take into consideration like what you want the piece to be. And is the person who's giving you note, are they on agreement about what you want the piece to be? Tell me what you want this to be because I can't give you notes on what, how to make it better or more effective. If I'm just going off of what I think it is or what I want it to be, it's not my project. So you need to make sure that the people around you that are giving you those notes are asking you the question of, what do you want this to be? What do you want to accomplish with it? Where do you want it to go? And only then can you have a calibrated notes that are actually effective. Writing ensemble pieces versus writing with just a small number of lead, well, one lead character. I don't know whether you've seen that evolve over drafts where it's like, no, I really do need another person here. You guys have a lot of experience with ensemble. Yeah. Yeah, the hundred had I think at one point twenty six characters that we were tracking or something. Uh, yeah, and, and probably about eighty others. I mean, it was, it was all, it's almost Game of Thrones ish in that way. But yeah. Yeah, and 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 again though, when we would break those stories, we were still taking it as they were the lead of their own story, right? right. So your A, B, and C stories would more than likely have fifteen of those people mixed within that group, but it was still you were you were tracking that protagonist of that story. You always have your leads. And you build stories around your leads, and then you build out from that. You can have unusual episodes where the spotlight is on a secondary character and you're resting a lead character in television, but one way or another, you, are, you have a central point of focus. You know, Lost has a huge ensemble, but 
Jack is still the center point of focus for Lost. Like, all things kind of roll back to him. The show starts with him, and the finale ends with him. So you can kind of always find what the center is and who are the characters that you really have to focus on, and then everybody else on the outside of that. Um, I got good advice from a, uh, so one of my writers is a musician and, and he was like, you just gotta figure out who's the brides and who are the bridesmaids. <laughs> and you can have as many as you want, as long as there's one bride, then, you, then you're, like, you're good and you have a principle of organization. Um, and I thought that was funny because I just pictured like 25 girls in ugly pink dresses. Do you ever reuse any of the unused material for your project? Never. Never, but I tell myself I'm going to, yeah. which is how, <laughs> which is how I get through it. There's a lot of good stuff in here, Julie. We might want that someday. We should save that in a file somewhere that we will never open Thousands again. Thousands of files that are covered in tears I, I, and dust. Yeah. The home, homeless scenes file on my computer gets opened once every six years, and then I just feel sad and I close yeah. it again. Well, you you say that, there's a lot of good stuff in here. They were right. In yeah. But There's always that one line of dialogue, though, you know, that you cling to yeah, until the yes. final moment. And you're like, I'm going to get that line in there. And then nine times out of ten, you realize that line doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Either. Unfortunately for me, I usually realize that on opening night. <laughs> I'm you just like, I fought you know for it, it. I fought for it. And then suddenly I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> they were all right. <laughs> and then I just it, sneak out and go to the bar. Um, I was just going to say what it's similar to is, you know, when you're going through old clothes and you hang on to stuff because you're like, but I like this. And I'm going to fit wear into it. it again. And Exactly. And I wore it those 15 times and it's great. I can't get rid of it. But you know, every time you go to your closet, you're never going to pick it. You're just never going to pick it, but you hold on to it. It is so liberating to just let it go and go like, there's other stuff out there. I will come up with something else versus clinging. You really will. Your brain will yeah. come up with it's, other things. It's like, it's like turning down a date with like Brad Pitt. Like, it should feel really cool. We've you're like, that's that. right. Like, you're like, I'm not saying I've ever turned down a date with Brad Pitt. And, um, He's uh, tech of ale. Huh? He's tech of ale. <laughs> but, like, this idea that, like, if you can be so excited about the fact that you're like, you know what, I'm going to write, I can write a million other great scenes. Like, I'm a scene generator. Like, but by the time I'm 90, I will have written, you know, 180 scripts. Then it just helps to be able to let go of those. And because you just know, like, if you talk to your inner elder, you know, and just be like, 90 year old Jess and she's like bitch you're gonna write so many scripts don't worry about this one this is just a drop in the bucket and five years you're gonna look back on this script and be like ah uh, my craft wasn't as good as it is now and that's a good thing as an emerging writer getting nervous to share your work like did the environment you chose to first start sharing your work and get feedback like did you nail it on the first try or did you have to try several different places or groups or people to be able to find the place that felt safe enough and effective enough yeah more so right Great. I, I would answer that by saying I did because I went to film school. And so the thing, the key that was helpful, and this is, can translate into advice because everybody's different, but is that we were all learning the same way. And so we had the same language. What was incredibly helpful and productive was we would be able to say to each other in your fourth scene, you're not using the whatever terms we were using or whatever, but we were learning from the same people. So it, we had the same language. If you can find you know, somewhere to study or a group of people who you know are, they don't have to be like-minded culturally or ideologically, but in terms of the craft, you, you cut down so much by knowing you're speaking the same language. And I've been in lots of rooms and different people, and it can all be helpful, but my core group who I learned with sort of comes back to basics in a yeah, way. Yeah, I think that's all right. I, I, I've been in like three or four writers groups over the course of you know 15 years. And the first writers group was uh, a bunch of us that just kind of found each other on line kind of randomly. And it was a weird group, although like a couple of the people from that group are also working writers. But it was like the vibe was wrong. And we just knew it. Like, we, like you could tell, I was like, oh, we're, and we're just like, it was a bit of a hodgepodge. And then the next writers group was um, a group of people that I had taken classes with at UCLA. And so that was a much better group because I'd already been working with these people. They had already read my work in a class environment. So it was so much easier to trust and know what kind of notes I was gonna get. And then since then, Julie said, we've 
had our group of people and they were all at about the same level as we are where you That's know helpful so too, people so, at the same yeah level. so it was like we're all on the verge of breaking in you know we could kind of gauge because of the type of jobs we were doing and where we were in our how many years we'd been working at this it just made sense and so that group's been going for six or seven years because we've all been kind of graduating up together I think an important thing to remember if you're if you're not getting if you're getting feedback from people who aren't like paying you to do a job, right, is that the purpose of a note is to help the writer write. The purpose is not for the person giving the note to be right. And so if someone gives you a note and it makes it easier for you to write, it's a good note. If someone gives you a note and it makes it harder for you to write, it's a shitty note and don't and, and be, or it's a note that is correct, but you're not at the place where you can hear that note yet. And so you can kind of put it in a box. And I think you should just, if you get in a writing group and it makes it easier for you to write, that's a good writing group. And if you get in a writing group and it makes you furious and it makes it harder for you to write, then that's not a good group for you. And that's cool, that's someone else's jam. And I think you can just trust yourself. I think that's the most important thing that I would want to even just end on like for this whole panel, which is, you know, your craft has to get really, really good. You gotta work on that craft, but you also can't lose your artistry and you have to trust your instincts and you have to trust like what you have to offer that no one else has because you guys cannot compete with these people on their level of craft. They have been doing it longer professionally. You can't compete with them on craft. The place where you can compete with these people is in regards to showing the uniqueness of your voice in the way that, because your artistry, they can't compete with you on that. They can't be you as an artist. And so most of the things that we end up hiding from people because they think it makes us weird and it makes us feel vulnerable, as artists, those are the things that we you should be screaming from the rooftops. You should be wearing your crazy on your sleeve. You should be pulling your wounds from your childhood out and be like, oh, let's do something with this. And the more open and vulnerable and brave you can be, the more likely you're going to be able to enter into this field because you have something to offer that no one else does. And that's the most valuable thing. Um, and so on that note, I would just say, is there anything you would like us to be watching? If you want to plug anything that you're doing, um, where can we watch your work? I have work? one thing. I have a movie on Netflix that's, I never know how to say it. It's not coming out. It's dropping. Okay. It's streaming uh, November 8th. It's a teen movie, but it's really sweet and cute. It's called Let It Snow. So I definitely, anybody who's also under 24, I highly recommend it for. It's very sweet. And over 24. Over 24, I, you know, I think it's, but yes, that's my next thing. I think a Star Trek Animated will be out in like 15 years. I don't know how long it takes. <laughs> it takes a really long time. Uh, but Woo Assassins, the season of that is on Netflix. Uh, we uh, wrote a couple episodes of that. And then The 100, we worked on seasons three, four, five. So. One of the things, though, that we're actually starting is an Instagram for Benson Sisters. We're going to be posting like three to five minute little um, informational clips, like the real how the sausage is made. So uh, what does it mean to be a PA? How do I get those jobs? Um, interviewing friends who do script coordinating, stuff like that so that you the stuff that we would have wanted to know living in Illinois great what's that handle uh, you it's, it's it's Benson underscore sisters there you go at uh, that's at Instagram and at Twitter and then you can get there so too we're just starting that now yeah. awesome. how about you guys Rent our movies. <laughs> Five feet apart in The Curse of La Llorona. That's I bit. recommend back to back because you will learn so much about theme. And same thing with, uh, yeah, like everyone's stuff, if you watch them back to back, is, is quite, I binged all y'all's stuff like, like four days ago. It was super fun. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and tears were shed, and I was like, oh, violence. Um, loved it. Uh, yes, and then also thank you to ISA. They have a lot of opportunities on their website for writers and gigs, so, you know, please check them out.